This week, I was uh, blessed with what I'm going to call some perfect timing. It was perfect timing on a flight from Houston to Kansas City. And the perfect timing was being able to experience that two-hour nighttime flight on the west side of a giant storm front that extended from North Texas all the way into the Midwest. And so the timing made it such that as that giant front was moving to the northeast, our plane just stayed to the west and followed it all the way. And so there were moments, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see it or not, Obviously, it's nighttime, but there were moments where you can see city lights on the ground. You can see the storm in the middle, and I know you can't see it on those screens, but at the top, you could see the stars. And then there were other moments. We never flew into it, but there were times that it felt like the wing of the plane was holding hands with the storm because when I looked out that plane window, all you could see in every direction was just lightning. As I'm taking in the show for some two hours, God kept taking me to Exodus. And how many times we've seen in this book God reveal himself, speak to his people from the storm and the lightning. For example, in Exodus chapter 20, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, it reads this way, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Their view of God made them tremble. And I love Moses' response to them. Moses' response was, look, you don't have to be afraid, but don't sin against him. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're looking at his power. Is he safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. Throughout this study of Exodus, we have seen it. God continues to give opportunity for us to see more and more of who he is. And I'm asking you, do you remember, I, I showed you this along the way, there were 10 plagues in Egypt, right? But after the sixth plague, God made an incredible statement. His statement goes like this in Exodus chapter 9, verse 15, for by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. He's like, don't be mistaken. We're not at plague number six because this is some sort of a fair fight between us. He's like, I could have done this with one, but I've raised you up for this purpose that I might show you my power and that my name, my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. He's like, I'm going to show you. I want you to see. Even 3,500 years from now when a group of people are going to meet in a little town in Missouri that most people don't even know exist, I know they exist and I want them to see who I am. We have prayed every week in this seven-week series that that would be the case for us, that we would see him. This series that we call Exodus and Seeing God. And so one more time today, in the final week of this series, I want to take you to Exodus 33. So if you got your Bible, I want you to go to Exodus chapter 33, and I want, you to show you, I want to show you just another incredible story. Exodus 33 Verse 1, here's how it reads. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place. You and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go up to the land I promised on earth, on earth, on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob saying, I will give it to your descendants. 
I will send an angel before you. That's pretty cool. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go with you. Because you are a stiff-necked people. And I might destroy you on the way. Now, this happens right after the incident with the golden calf, all right, that Peter taught you last week. While Moses is up on the mountain with God, God giving him the commandments, one of which is don't make idols. The people were on the ground doing what? Making an idol. And God said, you are a stiff-necked people. Funny term. It means stubborn. It means obstinate. It means difficult to lead, probably originated from the idea of an ox who would be led like by a farmer to do the work, and the ox is not cooperating. It's interesting in the New Testament that Stephen, in the book of Acts, when he gives his last address before they take his life, he calls those people stiff-necked people because they had put Jesus to death. They rejected who he was. Now, I want you to see in what God says here, this is, this is, I think, what many people might consider to be a dream offer. The offer is, I'm going to get you to the promised land. I'm going to get you to the land that I promised, right? And not just give you enough, but it's a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to provide even more than you need, and I'm going to send an angel, an angel ahead of you to protect and to clear the way. I'm saying, what an offer. In fact, to me, it sounds very much like an ideal American version of the blessing of God. His hand, his favor, his direction, his provision, his protection. And really, if you think about this scenario in Exodus, there's nothing in return. He's asking for nothing in return. Because if God's not going with them, then they don't have to worry about the whole tabernacle deal. They're not setting up the tabernacle and all. God's God's not going with them. There is no church attendance required. There there are no offerings required. There there are no prayers required. God's saying, I'm going to do all this but I'm not going with you. But Moses has begun to see God differently. And Moses recognizes that God's provision and God's protection is not a substitute for God's presence. You can't replace presence. And Moses is not okay with just settling for an angel. I love that. Like most of us, if we heard God say, I'm going to put an angel in front of you, clear the way, we're like, yes! That's what some of you asked for. God, if you would send an angel to open, right? He's like, I'm not okay with just settling for an angel. I want God's presence. So here's what Moses says in verse 15. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Moses says, God, even though you are offering to give us honestly what many of us have always dreamed of, come on, this group of people... This sounds like heaven compared to the hell of slavery in Egypt that they have been in. Thanks, God. But if it comes without your presence, then no thanks. If you're not going, we don't want to go. My question is, why would Moses say that? And could it be, could it be that Moses has begun to see God as beautiful 
not just useful. What if? Now, even philosophy says when something is beautiful to you, then you take pleasure in it without regards for its purpose. Here's what I mean. When, when, when you want to be around someone just because of that person, that is you're doing so because you see them as beautiful. An example might be, let's suppose that you are engaged to be married, but the week before your wedding, you find out that your rich parents, you're like, okay, this ain't my story. Just play along, all right? Your rich parents have suddenly lost everything. And because so, your fiance breaks off the marriage. You would feel used. Why? Because just you doesn't seem to be enough. Y'all, we tend to do that with God. We tend to do that with God. We tend to approach him more for his usefulness. But not Moses, not here. He sees God as beautiful, not just useful. And could it be that he sees that without God, everything else is useless. Come on, without God, eventually everything else fades. Today, you're at the top of your field, but tomorrow, you are fighting for revel re uh, relevance and respect, right? Today, you're beautiful, but tomorrow, things start drooping, and they start aching, and no amount of oils or injections or incisions will stop that process. Today you're a strong family, but tomorrow you're trying to pick up the pieces, maybe as you are gathered around a graveside, or maybe as you are gathered around legal documents due to betrayal or abandonment. Eventually everything fades. Well, not only do those things fade without God, but without God, they also fade you. Because if you give your life to anything else, eventually it leaves you empty. So think about Moses, the prince of Egypt, right? Think about Moses who at one time, his position in Egypt meant that he, he knew more about what it would mean to, I mean, everything that we could dream of, he would have. All the wealth that we could dream of. All the power that we could dream of. But he knows all that is worth nothing without God's presence. Moses represents some people that I have met throughout my lifetime. That at one time in their life, if you look at them, it looks like they've got everything but without God. And then later in life, they come to a place where they had nothing, but they had God. And you know what I have discovered in every circumstance? Every one of those people, in the end, would choose nothing but with God. Moses says, thanks for the offer, God, but I want you. And God's response in verse 17 goes like this. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. And we read that and we think, well, of course God knows Moses' name. I mean, he, he's called Moses. Moses is like, of course he knows him by name. But come on, when we read that, we realize what God's saying here. Maybe to know your name means something deeper than simply an arrangement of letters by which we address you. Moses, being a great leader, sees a door open here, and he goes for it. And in verse 18, Moses said, now show me your glory. I believe this is a hinge moment in Moses' life. Now, not a hinge moment in terms of whether or not he knows who God is. and when, I mean, God is using him in an incredible way. But it is this hinge moment for Moses 
Because in a sense, I think what's going down here is Moses is saying, God, if I'm going to want you more than anything else, then I don't want just a little. I want all of you. God, will you show me who you are? So in verse 19, here's what God says. The Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah. In your presence, I I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Now, when we read this story, does this remind you of any stories that we have studied this year? And I'm answering it, yes, it does, particularly back when we were in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. We're in the second one. We're moving through the first five books this year. But in Genesis chapter 32, there was this guy named Jacob. Anybody remember Jacob? And Jacob has a brother named Esau. He's about to re-encounter, re-engage his brother Esau. And on that night, a stranger shows up. Remember? And they wrestle all night long, it says. But at daybreak, the stranger says, you got to let me go. And as we read on in the story, we begin, why? Because you cannot see my face. And Jacob's got one request. He's like, I'm not going to let go of you until you bless me. And he asks a question. What is your name? And do you recognize the similarity? Do you recognize the familiar language? I told you back then, I want you to see it again today. When Scripture talks about God's name and his face and his glory, in a way it is all wrapped together. It is interchangeable at times in in how God describes it. Go go back to Exodus chapter 34, and and now I'm going to show you what happened. Exodus chapter 34, next chapter, verse 5. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him, and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. This little section of scripture right here, and in particular verse 6 to 7, is the most quoted text in the Bible by other writers, authors of the Bible. It's the most quoted text of the Bible. In other words, other, other, Bibli- other people who write the other books besides Exodus, this is the most quoted text text. It's called at times the 13 medot, which is referring to 13 attributes of God as he is describing who he is. In a way, I would describe Exodus 34, 6, and 7 as sort of like the John three sixteen of the Old Testament. It was that popular of a text. At sporting events back in the Old Testament, they would hold up signs, Exodus 34, 6, and 7. All right? Instead of John 3, 16. All right? Why was it such a big deal? It's because it was declaring who God is. And what I want you to see today, because obviously I can't take you through all 13 attributes. That's an awesome study. You could do it. But when you, when you look at what it says here, we've got a God who's saying, I'm infinitely loving, wanting to forgive all. But he also says, I am infinitely just, 
and I can never let sin go unpunished. It's like, well, okay, God, which one? <laughs> infinitely loving, willing to forgive all, or infinitely just, can't let sin go unpunished? Which one is it? It, it sounds like a contradiction without the New Testament. But with the coming of the New Testament, that's because it's the coming of Jesus. And remember what I began to show you a couple of weeks ago, especially about the Apostle John when he writes in his gospel, and he's the one who uses a tremendous amount of language from Exodus. Jesus, who is the word, he says, tabernacled among us. Remember that? And we, we see his glory. Well, I want to show you a couple of more verses. I want to show you. Ex or John chapter 1, verse 16 says, out of his fullness, that's Jesus, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I'm just going to tell you, you look it up, grace and truth are the Greek wording for the Hebrew words graciousness and faithfulness in Exodus 34. Pretty cool. John's still connecting, all right? And then he says, no one has ever seen God. That's what our story is about today. Nobody's ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Nobody can see God. God said, you can't, you can't, as a sinner, you can't see me and live. But Jesus, who is without sin, he can see God, but he also dies in the place of the guilty. And because he does, God can love infinitely and his justice is upheld. In other words, Jesus resolves the contradiction that it feels like exists in Exodus 34, the compassion of God exalted and the justice of God upheld. There's an old story, I don't think it's true, but I think it's good, and it helps us grasp. There was a Viking king who ruled a small country, and he was known as being the fairest king that ever lived and the most loving king that ever lived. But one day, this king realized that someone was stealing from the treasury, and so he addresses the kingdom and he says, come on, you, you know, you know me and you know that, that I will try to help you in any way that I can, but you cannot steal. You cannot steal. Well, a week later, the theft is continuing and so he says, I don't want to have to do this, but look, whoever is stealing from the treasury, when they are caught, it is going to be ten lashes. There has to be some justice. A week later, the theft continues. And he says, I, I don't want to have to do this, but look, if, if whoever is caught stealing, it's going to be 20 lashes. And another week passes, and the theft continues, and so finally he lands at this place. He says, whoever is caught, it will be 40 lashes, which is almost the, like saying the death penalty. Two days after declaring that, the thief was caught in the act. It was the king's own mother. And the kingdom said, what is he going to do? He's the fairest king that's ever lived, and therefore there has to be justice. But he's also the most loving king that has ever lived, and how, he can't take the life of his own mom. After taking a day to think through what he would do, he approached the kingdom and said, justice is justice, she must be punished. They tie her hands, they rip open the shirt on her back, 
and the guard raises the whip in order to strike her when the king says stop. He steps down off of a throne, takes off his royal robe, and then takes off his own shirt. And he walks over and he engulfs his mom, arms around her, absorbing her into himself. His bare back now covers hers. And he turns to the guard and he says, hit her. And the guard said, I can't without hitting you. To which the king replies, that is not your concern. Hit her. And 40 lashes were given. And the king absorbed them all. That is what Jesus did at the cross for you and me. It's called substitution. And substitution is the mystery of the good news of Jesus that Moses couldn't see way back there in Exodus 34. He couldn't see it. But now we know. Moses was put in a rock to see the backside of God's glory. You and I have been put in Jesus to see the face of God's glory. Jesus said in John chapter 17, he said it this way. He said, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. He's talking to the Father. I have revealed you. My translation that I typically use NIV translates it that way. Most of them do because that's the way we would say it. I have revealed you. But the actual Greek word that is there is more specific. It literally reads, I have revealed your name. God, I have revealed your name to them. I want you to see today all the glory of God. It is loaded into his name. And when we get a look at Jesus, we begin to see pictures of that. Remember, before Jesus is crucified, they come to get him in the garden. The guards arrive to arrest him. Jesus says, who have you come here for? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am. And it says they all fall to the ground. (laughs) All of his glory has been loaded into his name. Just the speaking of his name laid them out. When God passes by Moses in the rock, we are not given a description of Moses seeing the brightness of God. We are given a description of Moses hearing God's proclamation of his name. And when God speaks his name, right, his glory, it is seen. The glory of God is loaded into his name. And early in the book of Acts, when we turn to the New Testament, the apostles want us to see it clearly In Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, Peter's first sermon, this is what he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, right? Now, that doesn't mean simply if you could just get people to say, verbalize Jesus, that's, that's a, but, but what does it mean? It means for those who will trust in who Jesus is and what he has done, his name, who he is and what he's done, because of his name, who he is and what he's done, then when we call on his name, we find forgiveness. And when we call on his name, he gives us the righteousness of God. Granted in his name are all the promises of God toward us, right? When we call on his name, the chains of sin and death are broken. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
in Acts chapter 4. He, he says it again. In Acts chapter 4, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Well, why can't salvation be found in another name? Because there's no other name that holds enough power. Only his name. I don't know if this is right or not, and I'm clarifying that I don't know. But it feels like to me, maybe one of the ultimate evidences of a stiff-necked people, right? A stubborn people would be that we become stubborn and obstinate regarding the fact that God has only made one way to be saved. Like, are you kidding me? That God would say, I have made a way that all could come to me, and a stiff-necked people want to go, just one way? Why, why does it only have to be through? Does that not sound like the ultimate stiff neck to you? That, that, as Christians, the name of Jesus is precious to us because it, it is the only name with the power to save. So in Acts chapter 5, in Acts chapter 5, it says the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy even of suffering disgrace, but for the name. Why would they feel that way? I'd sing it for you if I could, but Miss Natalie Grant used to deliver some lyrics that go this way. The lost are saved to find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no place at the sound of your great name. And the enemy has to leave at the sound of your great name. You realize that the Jews, right, in, 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 in Moses' day, I mean, and even today, they will, they will not even write God's name because of such reverence and fear. The picture of where we started at the mountain, they are trembling in fear. Oh, but when God shows us who he is in Jesus, the name of Jesus has a different effect. It doesn't make us cower in fear. It makes us want to run toward him in worship. Jesus means Yahweh saves. Not just a God who creates and rules and judges, but a God who saves. So let's head for the finish line here with me asking the question, do you understand how we grow in knowing and loving God? Spiritual growth happens as you press deeper into the name. Everything in the Christian life really is in the name of Jesus, all right? So let me show you real quick, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, a little bit later in Exodus, Moses is going to go back up that mountain, God's going to give him the Ten Commandments, right? He gives them the, the tablets again, writes on the tablets. And Moses, he says when he comes down, he's glowing. And when he would meet with the people, he would have to wear a veil. But when he met with God, there was no veil. That's the context you need to understand when we read what we're about to read. Second Corinthians chapter 3, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate, we're looking at, we're marveling at the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Here's what I want you to see today. God doesn't change you by telling you to act better. He changes you 
by creating a new heart in you that desires to act like his heart. You know how good news that is? <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't change you by just saying, get it together. He changes you by doing a miracle inside of you that changes your desire for your heart to be like his. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, as we are contemplating his glory, as we are contemplating his face, as we are contemplating his name, there is a transformation that's happening, a changing, a growing that is happening in us. In other words, come on, recognizing the presence of God is not just like when you get that warm, fuzzy feeling because, you know, a song is sung or whatever happens. You recognize the presence of God because the Spirit of God makes the name, the face, the glory of God real in your heart. So Romans chapter 5 says the Holy Spirit's pouring out the love of God into our heart. He is, as we contemplate who he is, that love is growing in us. In, in, in Romans chapter 8, it's the Holy Spirit who brings about our adoption and says when we look at who God is and contemplate his glory, we know we can call him our dad. It's the Spirit who does that work in us. And in, in 2 Corinthians, there should not, in my opinion, there shouldn't be a chapter break with chapter 4, all right? But there is. But here's how it continues to read in 4.1. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the Word of God. Here, here's what that means. It means that on a day like today, I don't need to get up here and put anything toward you trying to get you to obey God by anything that, that's driven outside of a desire to know him, all right? For example, if I got up here and said, look, if you want God's blessing, you better do some stuff for God. You want him to meet your financial needs, you better be given to him. You want him to accept you, you better get in that quilt ministry, you see what I'm saying? Anything that's not based on simply knowing him more. We are not changed by religious activity. We are changed by the power of the Holy Spirit enabling us to absorb who he is. And then it says in verse 5, therefore, what we preach is not ourselves, but it's Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. We proclaim Jesus <laughs> and he is Lord, a name that is above every other name, Scripture says, and one day, one day, the whole world, whether they have trusted him or not, whether they belong to him or not, the scripture says those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and I don't even know if I can explain all that to you. It just means everybody, their knee is going to bow because they will recognize his name. He is Lord. Y'all, what scares me so much about this story in Exodus is my fear that so many people who come to church on a regular basis will simply settle for something with God where he promises to get them where they want to be, the promised land. He promises to provide, right, not just enough, but that, that he would give enough to enjoy this life. And maybe that he would, right, Give me that angel to protect and clear the way. There is a part of me that fears so much that people who, who come to church on a regular basis would like settle there instead of loving this God. Moving past just seeing him as useful, but seeing him as beautiful. So today I'm going to dare you. And this is a dare 
Or maybe you're at that place in your life where you're not sure if Jesus is real. You're not sure if this whole thing about God is true or not. I so admire you being here. I appreciate you being willing to listen, but I'm going to dare you to spend a month of your life and find out. You say, a month? My goodness. That's a long time. Not really. Not really if what I'm talking about here today is true. And the reason I say a month is because this is not a button you push, and it's not a contract that you sign, and we're done. It's a relationship. So I'm saying for a month, here's what I dare you to do. I dare you every single day for just one month to do what Moses did and ask Jesus to show you. Jesus, if you're real, and if you really do love me, will you show me? Every day, I'm saying, you don't have to spend an hour doing that. Just every day for a month, talk to him just like Moses did, and just ask, will you show me? Second, every day I challenge you to read one story about Jesus. Now, if you're new to the Bible, you're most likely going to find that in the, what's called the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all right? I don't care what order you go in. I'm saying just go to those four every day, pick a story about Jesus and read it every day. It won't take you long. The third thing I'm encouraging you to commit to is that in this month, once a week, you gather when God's people gather for the purpose of worshiping him, or it doesn't have to be like even this setting. It could be a Bible study that you could be a part of or something like that, but just once a week for a month, commit to gathering with God's people while you're praying every day. Show me, and while you're reading a story every day. Now, here's, I I don't mind telling you why I'm encouraging you, because I believe with all my heart he is the God who hears. And to those who call, you find him. But he most often uses his word to show you who he is. And he uses his body, his people, to show you who he is. I dare you. But I'm going to throw this doubt out, this dare out also to maybe you've known him a long time. But maybe you would honestly say, I'm afraid I'm that person who for too long has settled for God get me where I need to be and God give me what I need and God protect me. But you could honestly say in your heart, like, I don't know. I don't know how much I love him. Like, I don't know if I see his beauty. I dare you. Same dare. Every day, ask him to show you his glory. Every day, read a script, read a story of who he looks like and gather with God's people. I dare you. Well, for seven weeks, we have made this journey. Uh, In light of my little story at the beginning, I'm going to call it a flight, all right? For seven weeks, we have taken a pretty quick flight. And in a way, only seven weeks in Exodus kind of feels like a 40,000-foot view of who God is. But my prayer is that you can see him. Y'all, the other night looking out that plane window, I don't even know how to tell you what that was like. Um, It was one of those moments where you feel like, It's you and God, and he's talking loud. And I am looking at that scene where I can see storm, city lights, and stars. And it was just a reminder in my own heart, and I think God does this for us, him saying, you see the lightning in that storm? Since Exodus, man, I've been showing my power. I've been showing my power. But he said, you see the lights below those represent households he said I also want you to see my glory and the fact that I love every one of those households more than they can even imagine and I want them to know I want them to know and he said you see those stars remember my promise if you will trust me if you will trust me and you will grow to love me And you will do so even in the darkest nights of your life. 
I, God, will make you shine like the stars in the night. And the world will see the glory of God. God, may it be so in us. May it be so in us. God, I pray today for those who are on the search, exploring. God, even the fact of whether or not you are real, I am asking today, God, that you would give them what is needed, God, to spend the next days, weeks, month asking the question, God, calling out to you, I pray that by your spirit you would give them eyes to see your great name, who you are and what you have done. And God, I likewise pray for your church. God, I love these people so very much. I am so grateful for what you have God crafted in them and created them to be together as your body. But I'm praying for us together too that, God, you might give us what we need. God, maybe in this month to ask, show us your glory. And as we read the stories and as we gather with your people, that you will open our eyes to the beauty of who you are. We love you. We thank you for allowing us to study this together. There is nothing of this that we take in and understand except for you. God, continue to open our hearts, open our eyes, and help us to see your glory. In the name of Jesus, I ask it today.